it's always been quite odd to me that I can diagnose and treat a problem involving any area of the body as a doctor, but weirdly have very little knowledge about the teeth. I can give advice on symptoms ranging from a mild itch to severe depression, but ask me anything about your teeth and I'll probably tell you to see a dentist. The division between medicine and dentistry seems quite strange at a first glance because many medical conditions that are managed by doctors bring about dental problems as well. And it's recently been proven that there's a strong association between gum disease and things like diabetes and heart attacks. But as we'll see in this video, the two professions of doctor and dentist were created in two very different paths. To fully understand why they're separate, we'll need to combine the histories of medicine, surgery and dentistry in this video. The practice of dentistry probably started around the time humans discovered agriculture around 10,000 years ago as tooth decay became more common around this time. Fossils of skulls have been found back dating 9,000 years which show evidence of their teeth being drilled on by Stone Age tools. There's also evidence that dentistry was already widespread by the time the earlier civilization started to write things down, about 5,000 years ago. Instructions of how to perform several dental procedures can be found in the earliest medical texts from places like Egypt, Mesopotamia and China. The practitioners of the time were able to do things like replace teeth, fix jaw fractures and treat toothaches. They also had early ideas about what actually caused tooth decay, claiming that small worms that reside within the teeth slowly ate away at it. Even some of the oldest codes of law recognised the importance of dentistry. The Code of Hammurabi was created in 1754 BC in Babylon and contains the removal of teeth as one of its punishments. You'll find the origin of the phrase an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth from this book. Something very important to note is that these ancient societies rarely had any formal path of training a person would have to go through in order to call themselves a doctor, dentist or surgeon. Most people learnt medicine by undertaking apprenticeships where they closely shadowed the senior medical specialist for a number of years until they were confident enough to give treatments and perform procedures on their own. And many physicians of the past never limited themselves to just a single branch of medicine. In a single day, a doctor might have prepared a mixture to cure a sick patient's fever, remove the rotten teeth of a different person and then excise a breast tumour of a cancer patient. But this was long before the time of antibiotics and anaesthesia, so most surgeries were considered to be very dangerous and only to be done as a last resort. Many surgeries caused more harm than good, which meant that the medical skills of surgeons were less respected than those of a butcher. And by the time of the Greek physician Hippocrates during the 5th century BC, doctors started to be held to certain standards. A main tenet of the Hippocratic Oath is to do no harm, and the original oath forbade doctors from performing dangerous surgical procedures like abortions and the removal of kidney stones. He explicitly said that only surgeons should attempt these things. This clearly shows that the ancient Greeks made a clear distinction between who was a doctor and who was a surgeon. This distinction spread throughout the medieval world. As the scientific nature of medicine started to become more apparent, Medical schools began to be established from around the 9th century. The first of its kind was in the southern Italian city of Salerno, where many aspiring doctors were taught about medical knowledge from all around the known world. The curriculum had very little surgery or dentistry, and these doctors saw themselves to be professionals and to be above the unskilled work that surgeons did. Meanwhile, in the surgical world, the most prominent group of people that performed surgeries in Europe happened to be barbers. These barber surgeons were originally hired by monasteries to do minor procedures such as cutting hair, pulling out teeth and bloodletting. But as they became more popular around the year 1000 AD, they began to work in towns and even some palaces, performing complex operations like amputations or trepanation. But as medical schools became more respected around the continent, the gap between doctors and surgeons became even wider. Barber surgeons continued to be trained by apprenticeships whereas doctors became increasingly reliant on going to medical school to complete their training. In England, doctors were taught at either Oxford or Cambridge Medical School, and in 1421, it was officially written into English law that you could only practice medicine in the country if you had a medical degree from one of these places. This was followed in 1518 by the formation of the Royal College of Physicians, 
a professional body created to make sure that medicine was being safely practiced throughout the country. It wasn't that much longer after this that surgeons realised that they too required some regulation. The 16th century saw great advancements in surgical knowledge around Europe, as the contributions of people like Vesalius, Fabri and Pare finally brought some respect to the profession. And in 1540, a parliamentary act in England created a company of barbers and surgeons. This created a division between barbers and surgeons by declaring into law that only barbers were allowed to cut hair and only surgeons were allowed to perform surgery. The only procedure that they could both do was the removal of teeth. Surgeons broke off from the company around 200 years later and by the beginning of the 19th century, most surgeons in Europe stopped being trained by apprenticeships. Surgery and medicine were finally reunited as the surgeons decided to join medical schools and go through the same training as doctors. But as you can see, dentistry was left behind by the surgeons. Fixing teeth was still considered to be a layman's trade, so medical schools largely ignored the teeth when teaching the students. But a young doctor from France called Pierre Fouchard had other ideas. He became interested in dentistry after he joined the Navy and saw many sailors who were suffering from scurvy and during the early 1700s, he was considered one of the most skillful surgeons of his time as he pioneered many techniques in oral and maxillofacial surgery. Fouchard would go on to cement his legacy as the father of modern dentistry in 1728 by publishing the first ever complete scientific description of dentistry, which he titled The Surgical Dentist. The book contained detailed information on all aspects of dentistry, ranging from orthodontics and oral prosthetics to dental pathology and anatomy. He also disproved the long-held belief that tooth decay was caused by a worm, instead stating that sugar and acid was responsible for rotting teeth. Fouchard caused the field of dentistry to explode and inspired many surgeons who worked purely on the teeth to start referring to themselves as dentists. And as the field started to increase in professionalism, he and many others started to advocate that dentists needed to be trained by a university education and no longer by apprenticeships. His wish was fulfilled 80 years after his death. After failing to convince the University of Maryland Medical School to teach dentistry, a group of dentists led by Horace Hayden and Trappin Harris founded the first ever dental school in America in 1840, which they named the Baltimore College of Dental Surgery. And as the importance of a good dental education became more apparent, other countries around the world followed suit and created their own dental schools, meaning that dentistry would finally become a medical profession. This has largely been the status quo ever since. Even though dentistry is as much a field of medicine as specialties like ophthalmology or psychiatry, the gap between dentists and doctors have remained firm for the last 200 years. But as more links between oral and whole body health are found, a movement to unify the two professions might spring up sometime in the near future. Many universities around the world already run lectures where the dental and medical students are taught together and institutions such as Harvard have recently launched initiatives with the goal of integrating oral and medical health. 